So I'm going to preface my remarks with just two um, disclaimers or comments. The first is uh, I don't, I mean, if, if your law school is anything like where I went to law school, you're constantly in rooms where, where people, uh, often white men, are just talking at you and <laughs> telling you about all the things that they've done and all the things they think and the thoughts they have. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do have some things I'd love to, to share, but I also want to make sure that we preserve a, a large chunk of this time for comments and questions, because I think it's the, in the question and answer where I can really start to respond to some of the things that are most on your minds. So um, I also want to just set a norm where if I'm talking and there's something I say that is interesting or problematic or um, in, insufficiently explained or you want to hear more about just why don't you raise your hand? And then even w when I'm just doing my opening remarks, we can like have a little conversation about whatever it is I've just said and the thought that you had. Just um, say your name if you're comfortable so that I can like actually address you as a human being. The second thing um, I want to say is that um, I, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of views about the world that I've developed uh, through a very particular set of life experiences. So my entire career I've been representing people who, uh, for um, people who are in cages, people who, whose family members are in cages, people who can't afford an attorney, um, both as a criminal defense lawyer and then as a civil rights lawyer. And so I've developed a very particular perspective about the way that our legal system works and our society more generally. I'm not claiming that this perspective is objectively correct or that I have all the answers. Like All I can really offer you is my own perspective, some of which you may agree with, some of which you may disagree with, but I'm offering it in the spirit of trying to share some of the things that I have started to think about, about how these systems function and how they can be changed and, and in many cases how they can be eliminated and what are some of the beautiful things we can replace them with. Uh, so those are the two disclaimers. Now I'm gonna tell you three uh, quick stories that I think illustrate both the work that I've been devoting myself to for the last 15 years and also some of my thinking about where we are as a society and as a legal system and as attorneys and future attorneys with respect to, to what, that, what, what those injustices look like. So, one of the first things I did when I got a grant actually from Harvard Law School to quit my job as a public defender and to start um, a nonprofit organization. And you know, if people are interested in the Q&A, we can talk about my very dim views about the nonprofit industrial complex um, that I've developed over the years. <laughs> um, so I am not encouraging people to, to in, in, in any way to go work in the nonprofit industrial complex, but I did that and there is good work happening in small pockets of it. Um, but I think that um, I got this grant and I was sort of trying, like, trying to figure out what to do. And actually one of the things I did was, um, you mentioned Bill Quigley in the introduction, which is so fortuitous. Bill is a mentor of mine and, and Bill and I worked for a long time on a very difficult and, and painful case to shut down the debtor's prison in New Orleans, Louisiana together. And through the work that Bill and I did, we stopped um, the extraction of tens of millions of dollars from the poorest people in New Orleans and got thousands of people out of jail in New Orleans. And I think back on that work with Bill, um, who's now retired, um, as a really fond moment in my career. And that was one of the things I did. But one of the other things I did was um, I started traveling around the country just going in the back of courtrooms, just watching what was going on, talking to people's families who were looking at, and, and in many cases, um, really disturbed by what was happening to their loved ones. And uh, one of the places that I went was Alabama, where I had started my career as a public defender. And um, after being you know, physically removed from a number of courtrooms, um, turns out in Alabama, you're not allowed to make objections from the courtroom pews if you're not a lawyer barred in Alabama. Um, even if what you're watching is really disturbing. <laughs> um, so, but one of, the, one of the, the places it led me was um, a really horrific jail um, in a city called Clanton, Alabama in um, January of 2015, so nine years ago. And on the morning I got into the Clanton jail, I met a woman named Christy. And Christy had been arrested for shoplifting from Walmart and because Christy was really poor, she couldn't afford a couple of hundred dollars, which is what the 
local legal system was requiring for her to be released. And Christy also had two young children. And those two young children did not know where their mom was. They didn't know she was being held for ransom down the street at the local jail. Um, and Christy was really distraught. Like many of my friends um, who have children, um, if they're separated from their children for any period of time, they get quite anxious, especially little children. And Christy was uh, really confused and disoriented and didn't know where her kids were, didn't know what had happened to them when the cops took her away because they also took her away with her romantic partner and the father of her children, who was also alleged to have been shoplifting from Walmart um, so that the family could survive. And um, so she started crying a lot and crying more and was really inconsolable inside the jail. And uh, the jail people in Clanton did what they do in many jails that I've been investigating all over the country. They, um, instead of letting her out, <laughs> they um, brought her to a hallway in the jail where there's no security cameras. And in that hallway, they keep a restraint chair. And they put Christy in this restraint chair and strapped her in and they started tasing her body over and over and over again until she could no longer cry anymore. And I met her the morning after that had happened to her. And you know, I, I photographed all of the wounds on her skin from where the prongs of the electric device had gone into her body. And we talked a lot about, um, you know, in, in this moment of crisis for her, she had this incredible and beautiful perspective. It's hard to talk about without getting emotional. Um, but she, she said to me, I don't want this to ever happen to another mother. And so that, that day, actually, um, because by the time I met Christy, I already had all of the, I had sort of um, targeted Clanton for a lot of reasons um, as the first city I was going to try this in. Um, I'd even gone to, in Washington, D.C. to the Department of Injustice and told them that I planned on challenging the um, money bail system around the United States. And... Um, <laughs> The lawyers there said, well, you know, that's never going to be successful because we, we do money bail in over 3,000 jurisdictions all over the country. And um, so by the time I, I met Christy in the jail, um, we, we already had all of the documents ready. And I described to Christy what I was interested in doing. And, and she was so excited about um, working on the case with me. And um, so that day, Christy became the first person in decades since the rise of mass incarceration to challenge the idea that a human being can be put in a cage prior to being convicted of anything solely because they lack access to cash. They can be separated from their kids. Um, they can lose their job. They can lose their precarious housing. They can be interrupted with vital medical care. And, and, and so that was really the first um, case I ever did challenging the money bail system. We've since done dozens of these all over the country. We've gotten hundreds of thousands of people out of jail uh, in these cases all over the country and in a lot of places. And, and um, six weeks after we filed that case, um, the DOJ intervened in our case on our side and uh, actually said this argument that this one woman was making from her jail cell was now the official position of the U.S. government. And we filed 12 more of those just in 2015 alone. Um, so that's story number one. Um, and Christy, by the way, is one of the uh, women who uh, I've dedicated my book, Usual Cruelty, to. Uh, she, unfortunately, she passed away uh, and didn't live to see us win her case. Um, her family continued the case in her honor. Um, the second story is about the Federal Bail Reform Act. Has anyone ever heard of the Federal Bail Reform Act? No one? A couple people nodding? Okay. So um, there was this movement of liberal... Um, you know, well-meaning people, um, really led in, in, in many respects officially by Bobby Kennedy when he was attorney general and a bunch of um, prominent lawyers, uh, most of them uh, white men, and including a Supreme Court justice. And they, they ended up, you know, having conferences at law schools and, and writing law review articles. And they, they sort of um, arrived in the 60s at this consensus that it's unfair and unjust to make the decision about who is in a cage and who is home with their family based on how much money they have. And so they decided they were gonna do what, what they called the bail reform movement. And um, it, it, it culminated in, um, in virtually no states uh, making any changes, but the federal government 
passing a law uh, modeled after a law that they tried in the District of Columbia, where I live, um, that was an attempt to get rid of the idea of wealth-based pretrial detention. And they passed this law with much fanfare, uh, finally, in 1984. And on the day they passed the law in 1984, proclaiming this huge victory for justice and fairness and equality because the federal statute has a line in it that says something to the effect of um, no person shall be detained prior to trial um, you know, because they can't um, you know, afford a financial condition of release. Okay? Um, so so about tw on the day that was passed, about 24% of all people charged with federal crimes were detained prior to trial because they couldn't pay. So it was a big problem. About a quarter of all people, even though they're presumed innocent, were detained prior to trial. Today, as I'm standing here talking to you on the 40-year anniversary of the Bail Reform Act, 72% of people charged with federal crimes are detained prior to trial. Now, they're not detained because they can't pay, typically now in federal court. They're detained because a court has found them to be dangerous or a court has found them to be a flight risk. So, if you look at the demographics of the people, so, that, so just for those of you keeping track um, at home, that's a, a rise of 300% in the rate of detention. It went from one quarter to three quarters of people who are now detained, even though they're presumed innocent when charged with federal crimes. If you look at the demographics of that population, they're more disproportionately poor, more disproportionately black, more disproportionately immigrant than they were before the big reform, okay? So let's put a pin in that, right? Um, and by the way, I could have chosen a story uh, about virtually any other reform you've ever heard of to the criminal punishment system, right? Probation and parole were once pitched as a huge reform to reduce incarceration. They are now the leading cause of incarceration in the United States, okay? 25% mm -hmm. of people that are in state prison right now went there, not for the, being convicted of a new crime, for a technical violation of probation or parole. Another 15% went to prison for a minor misdemeanor crime while they were on probation or parole. That was pitched as a reform. Okay? I've written a whole article about body cameras and the total catastrophe of body cameras as a reform. Right? Virtually everything you, 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 are, you are presented with in the, the sentencing guidelines, federal sentencing guidelines, which were the you know, biggest increase in, in federal um, prison population in modern history, were a reform to make them more fair. Okay? Um, don't get me started on that. You can look up some of my threads on, on Stephen Breyer and, and the federal sentencing guidelines. Um, I could have used any other example, um, but I used the bail example um, because I think it, it, it sits really, really painfully with, with, with what happened to Christy and what I've been seeing all over the country since we've been winning these bail cases. What are we seeing? We're seeing the same systems um, put new labels on the very same behavior. So the companies that used to sell bail bonds now have a different storefront, and now they sell electronic monitoring devices. So instead of paying an upfront bail bond fee, um, now you're released for free, but you pay $12 a day to have an electronic monitor attached to your body. Or um, instead of um, paying a bail bond company, now you pay uh, a company that charges you $20 for a drug test, and you're required to drug test randomly three times a month. Right? So these are the same aggregations of wealth that are profiting in very similar and sometimes more ways, um, although uh, the label um, that we use to describe the form of repression that they're visiting on, on mostly poor people who are charged with crimes in this country is a little bit different, right? Um, the same is true with detention. So when people are not being detained because of money, um, because the system relies on the mass pretrial detention of people to coerce them into pleading guilty, right? That's the only way the system can process as many people from their homes and their jobs and their schools and their churches, et cetera, into government-run facilities and then into prison is by coercing quick guilty pleas. So like the system would really crumble if, if people weren't coerced into pleading guilty. If everyone took the chance to go to trial, right? We could not have a, enough lawyers, prosecutors, judges, juries, I mean, it would be impossible, right? So, so when you can no longer detain people um, because of money bail, what, there's a lot of pressure to detain people for other reasons. So we're seeing laws all over the country and behavior by judges um, that results in, in, in coming up with other uh, reasons to accomplish the same outcomes, okay? So that's story number two. Um, everyone with me? Okay, I know it's, is it Friday? Yeah, Friday afternoon. <laughs> Um, story number three is, um, you know, I, last night I flew back into D.C. quite late. I've, I've been uh, this week 
doing a really um, difficult investigation at a local jail um, in a mystery city. And uh, what I, I was sitting in the jail with, with a woman yesterday, um, and you know, there's so many things I could, I could talk about her experience, but I'll just say one is that um, jails across the United States over the last 10 or 15 years have eliminated uh, in-person visits for children. So if your uh, mom or your dad is in jail, you're no longer able to come visit them. And this has been a really um, catastrophic development for people in jail, particularly people who are in jail long term. So there's a lot of people in jails across the US who are sitting in pre-shot detention for a year, two years, three years, right? Um, often because they can't pay money bail. And uh, there are many children who um, would love to visit their mom or their dad, but who are no longer permitted to. And the reason that this happened is that, and this is something that we've begun investigating over the last few years, uh, the two largest prison and jail telecom companies um, started um, offering contracts to local sheriffs and local jails all over the country and said, um, if you eliminate in-person visits, um, it will increase the need for families to spend money on phone and video calls from the jail. So it's our view that if you, in, if you eliminate the idea of visiting for free, families will be forced into these really um, high-priced calls that we offer. And if you give us the monopoly contract at your jail for these calls, we will give you a cut of the extra profits that we make. And so one after another, jails all over the country, pursuant to these contracts, which you can get through FOIA, um, started eliminating the ability of children to see their parents, even though there's very strong empirical evidence that um, visiting, uh, children visiting their parents reduces crime, both inside and outside the jail, and has um, really profound long-term effects on the mental and physical well-being of the children. So this was not done for like public safety reasons. It was done for reasons of profit. And I was sitting with this woman talking about many things, including um, that you know, she hasn't been able to reach her lawyer in months, which is a other problem that we'll tackle another day if you invite me back. Um, and um, you know, we got to talking about the last time she saw her kids. And at this particular jail, um, there's a window on the women's floor that enables you to look out onto the street. So a lot of people's kids actually come and kind of like wave at their mom or their dad and, and you can like sort of coordinate the timing of it and you can, and the other thing that these kids do is um, they draw hearts and flowers and stuff on the sidewalk and chalk. And so their moms and dads can come and look at it and wave and see the drawings. Um, and when I was there, um, these, these kids uh, made these beautiful drawings on the sidewalk that I photographed um, before meeting with, with the women. And when I got back out of the jail, um, the sheriff had come out and was scrubbing them and washing them away. And within an hour or so, um, all these beautiful drawings and pictures that these kids had, had written on the sidewalk, not hurting anyone, right? Um, just a little ray of light for the people that are in the jail had been washed away for good. And the sheriff who's doing that um, ran on a platform of reform and is seen as a progressive leader in the law enforcement community. If you read my book, you'll understand that I don't like to use terms like law enforcement. Um, it gives one the impression that laws are neutral and they're enforced. If a law is broken, the law is enforced. When in reality, the police, prosecutors, judges, they're only enforcing some laws against some people some of the time. So that's why I use air quotes. I'm not trying to be um, silly. I'm just, I, I don't, I think that term is a term of propaganda, just like the Department of Justice. Um, or the Department of Defense, or you know, you get the point. Um, which used to be called the Department of War, by the way. Um, ask yourself sort of why that change was made. Um, so I digress often. Um, so um, 
this is, this is uh, what has passed. So, so this is someone who is um, portraying themselves as a beacon of reform. And, and yet, um, he runs a jail where um, not only are people detained because they can't pay bond, not only are people um, you know, living in horrific conditions with maggots in the food, et cetera, terrible medical care provided by a private for-profit company, where people can't even reach their lawyers for months at a time, um, where nobody has even bothered to file a bail motion to get them out of jail, where their lawyers won't even call me back. Um, I offer, hey, you know what? I've, turns out I've actually won a lot of these bail cases in federal and state Supreme Courts um, all over the country. And I would be totally willing to do this case for free with you. Or any, you know what? Any of your cases. I'll file a bail motion in every one of your client's cases. Can't get a call back, right? So not only, but all of that is being pitched as um, a very progressive jurisdiction, which is at the forefront of criminal justice reform in, in many ways. And I think um, th these three stories kind of interact to um, illustrate a point that has become, in my opinion, the central theme of a lot of our work uh, all over the country. The systems that we're fighting against are incredibly entrenched, incredibly powerful. I don't mean powerful necessarily just politically, although they do have a lot of political power. They make a lot of money. They have all of the things that come with a lot of money in our society. Um, they are able to pay uh, news outlets, essentially, to cover them. They are able to pay legislators to legislate laws that will um, increase the amount of profit they can suck out of the poorest people in our society. They are able to pay think tanks to write thought pieces and reports um, that minimize or downplay or even whitewash the harms that they're causing or that, that subtly affect the intellectual discourse in our society about sort of what kinds of harms are happening and what kinds of solutions we can imagine. Um, but they also have a really, I think, powerful um, cultural um, component to them. They, they are able to affect um, basic conceptions that we have about what safety is and whose safety matters and what kinds of investments our society should be making if it cared about safety. And so um, this, the combination of their political, economic, cultural kind of um, power and, and, and cachet has led to an environment where the people who um, benefit from these systems of repression are able to use their own incompetence and violence and ineffectiveness as an excuse constantly to get more resources in a perpetual cycle of oppression and violence and brutality and incompetence and reform. And many of the strategies that um, come to our minds as lawyers, strategies that were taught in law school, like, oh, we'll just bring a case about that thing, or write a policy memo, or like, write a bill. Many of these strategies, because they don't actually focus on changing the underlying balance of power that created the initial problem, they're not actually going to solve that problem. And in fact, they're gonna just put you right onto the, to the Ferris wheel, or what am I, is that what, carousel? Something like that. Um, uh, I'm really bad with things like that, but you know that thing that just goes around? Yeah, they're gonna put you on that thing. <laughs> and you're gonna become just another one of the well-meaning, there's lots of non-well-meaning people here, but I see many, many well-meaning people um, just going, being spun around in circles, uh, who, people who want to devote their life and careers to dramatically changing how these systems are functioning, and yet they're caught up in a strategy or with a set of tools that is just fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the problem. And so that's why one of the ways that we approach our work at Civil Rights Corps, and I don't actually think we're doing it that well, um, but I, I wanna make a point about what, what the kind of perspective that it takes, is we think about, um, should I take this case is a really complicated question. And secondly, if I take this case or this project, how should I do it? Who should my partners be? Um, what are the kinds of considerations that go into thinking about um, work as a lawyer? And it, and it turns out that the most important factors for us are, 
what are the chances that um, our work in this particular area, this issue, this case, this project, this, this geographic location, how can it be combined with the work of other people who are working to change the balance of power in this particular area to make a difference in that underlying balance of power so that the change that we achieve is enduring and significant and and so it can't be co-opted by all of the forces arrayed against us, whether those forces be forces of, of narrative propaganda or forces of economic profit or forces of sort of cultural norms, um, habits um, that a lot of these bureaucracies develop. Um, and then how do we, um, as people interested in social movements and in thinking about changing the balance of power in our society, how do we interface with and interact with the um, government and corporate bureaucracies that are going to be tasked with implementing something, even if we win it, whether it's a court case that we win or a bill that we get passed, um, those things just don't magically like manifest into the world. There's a whole um, bureaucracy that has to like actually make any policy change in our society happen, and this is something that that progressive movements have paid, I think. Um, far too little attention to is how the sort of fundamental um, culture uh, of bureaucracies can fundamentally corrupt even, even those rare moments where we're able to get a victory in court or in legislature. And so we're constantly thinking um, not just as legal strategists for how a particular legal ca claim can, can work and function um, and what happens if we win in court, but what are, what are the sort of constellation of other forms of advocacy, organizing, and narrative change that need to happen in sort of a perfect storm for our work in this area to be worth doing. And, and how, by the way, does that connect to much broader and deeper movements that we need to be a part of in our world that change some of the underlying balance of power in our society? Because it turns out you can't really solve any of the problems in the punishment bureaucracy without thinking about bigger questions like um, capitalism, like healthcare, like housing, like uh, borders and immigration, like the role of militarized bureaucracies, like the role of the power of police unions. All of these things are, are questions are, that are deeply connected and you can't win on the bail issue in a silo, right? Um, because those same interests I talked about earlier We'll just find a way to reproduce the money bail system with a different label. So, so, so how do we plug in our work to a much broader, bigger movement um, is really a central question that we ask ourselves in all of our cases.